Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for your patience today. Uh, just a few things to talk about at the top, and then we'll get right to your questions. Uh, per our announcement earlier this morning, Secretary Austin returned to work at the Pentagon today following his recent hospitalization. The Secretary is glad to be back in the building and has expressed his appreciation for the great medical care he received while at Walter Reed and for all the well wishes. As his doctors highlighted on Tuesday, he's anticipated to continue his full recovery and the Secretary remains squarely focused on executing his duties as Secretary of Defense. Secretary Austin also released a statement earlier today following the conclusion of the NATO Defense Ministerial meeting in Brussels. In it, the Secretary reaffirmed that the United States will continue to stand with our NATO allies and defend the sovereignty and the territory of every alliance member stating, quote, every inch of it. Our commitment to Article 5 remains ironclad, end quote. Secretary Austin also underscored that NATO remains the greatest alliance in history and that NATO today is stronger, more united, and more vital to our shared future than ever. The full statement can be found on DOD's website. Switching gears, earlier today, the, de uh, the department released its first ever resilient and healthy defense community strategy. The strategy will guide the DOD's actions in the coming years to improve both constructed facilities and the natural environment across our defense installations. More than 2 million military and civilian personnel live, work, train, raise children, and spend time with their families on the department's 538 installations, which include more than 280,000 buildings and 30 million acres of land. These spaces are critical to carrying out our DOD missions. It's therefore both a national security imperative and a moral obligation to ensure these communities are healthy, functional, and resilient, and that we're working to ensure a good quality of life for our entire force. Additional information to include a copy of the strategy is available on defense.gov. And finally, yesterday afternoon, the Missile Defense Agency and Space Development Agency launched six satellites to low Earth orbit from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. The satellites, which include two satellites for MDA's hypersonic and ballistic tracking space sensor and the four SDA tracking layer satellites are conducting initial testing. The launch of the two prototype systems will be followed by two years of on-orbit testing. And over the next few weeks, MDA and SDA engineers will run a series of tests and check out procedures to ensure the satellites are operating and communicating with the other systems as expected. For more information, I'd refer you to Missile Defense Agency Public Affairs. And with that, I'd be glad to take your questions. Let me go first to Associated Press, Tara Kopp, who's calling in today. Hi, General Ryder. Thanks for doing this. I uh, wanted to ask you about um, the White House briefing that just occurred on the Russian anti-satellite capabilities. Uh, has DOD been briefed on what, I guess, NSC and the Intel communities know about this? And has the, the Space Force and Space Command taken any sort of um, posture changes in order to secure U.S. Uh, satellites? Thanks. Thanks, Tara. Um, yes, I mean, we, we are... Uh, tracking what this is. We have been briefed on it. The the secretary, of course, is part of the, the national security team that's uh, been briefing the president. Uh, I'm not going to have anything beyond uh, to provide beyond what Mr. Kirby briefed over at the White House. Uh, and, and as it relates to Space Command, I, I don't have anything specific uh, in regards to any changes other than to say that, as you know, as space has become more congested and contested, uh, and in light of growing threats by strategic competitors in space, uh, U.S. Space Command and the U.S. Space Force uh, were established several years ago to maintain a dedicated focus on this vital domain and to ensure that we have trained and uh, prepared military space professionals whose mission it is to protect and defend America's interests in space. Thank you. We go to the room here. Orrin. Uh, the White House said there was ongoing outreach efforts to Russia regarding the anti-satellite capability. Is the Pentagon part of that? And has there been any any tr attempt to set up a call between Secretary Austin and his Russian counterpart about this? Yeah, I don't I don't have anything to announce in terms of, of calls, and I just refer you back to the White House on that. Liz? Um, so uh, the acting deputy, the acting under Secretary of Defense for Policy went. Um, is that in place of Secretary Austin going to brief on the Hill today? No. Okay, she so was planning to go. So over he that. what hadn't been recovering, she was would have gone anyway. <clears throat> um, she was requested to go over there, and she's part of the the sitting in on the briefing. Thanks, Laura. Um, on on the the Russian anti satellite weapon, um, 
can, can you say whether this was a new capability? Was there some sort of triggering event that this was put into the public discourse that, that Congressman Turner picked up on? Was it, is there anything new here, or is this something that has been, Russia has been developing for a while? Yeah, thanks. I'm, again, I'm not going to have anything to provide beyond what Mr. Kirby highlighted, uh, you know, and I'll underscore the key points he made. It, it's not an immediate threat. It's not an active capability. It has not been deployed. Uh, and as you highlighted, it's related to anti-satellite capability. So just leave it there. And then separately, can you, there were some reports that uh, there was another Houthi attack this morning in uh, the Red Sea. Can you confirm that or tell us whether, or tell us whether there was an incident today? I, I cannot. I know that as you've seen, uh, CENTCOM has been issuing daily uh, press releases on any activity in the Red Sea. So uh, if there has been, then I would keep an eye out for that. Idris. I think one of the things uh, Kirby said was some of the intel is months and potentially years old. When did the secretary, when was he briefed on it? Yeah, so I don't, I'm not going to provide a specific date. I can tell you he's tracking this particular issue. And on an unrelated note, uh, I think the last attack against U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria was February 4th. Um, do you believe this sort of tit for tat, the, the current um, uh, sort of uh, round of tit for tat attacks is now over? Um, you're right. We have not seen an attack against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria since uh, February 4th, but we'll see, right? I mean, as as we have been, we will maintain our focus on the mission that we're there to do, which is the enduring defeat of ISIS. But again, if our forces are threatened or attacked, we maintain the inherent right of self-defense and we'll take appropriate action. And did to the retaliation for the January 28th attack, or is that an indefinite sort of Again, as we've talked about before, I'm not going to speculate or, or talk about potential future operations other than, again, we reserve the right to protect our forces and we'll take appropriate action. Joseph. Just a follow-up on the news question. Does the department assess that, um, you know, the U.S. response, those two, two rounds of responses to these attacks led to this, I mean, what seems to be one of the <coughs> longest periods that U.S. forces haven't been attacked since October? I mean, that's really a, a question for the Iranian proxy groups to answer. Again, we'll see. I don't want to predict the future. We're, we're staying focused on the mission that we were sent there to do, uh, which is, again, to uh, participate in the international coalition to defeat ISIS. And then just a second one. Uh, U.S. officials told The Wall Street Journal uh, yesterday, the day before, that the U.S. is probing Israeli strikes in Gaza and the use of white phosphorus in Lebanon from, I think, October attacks including one of uh, an Israeli attack on the Jabalia refugee camp that killed more than 125 uh, people. Do you have any comment on that? Is the department, does the department have anybody looking into any Israeli uh, attacks using U.S. weapons? Yeah, I'm not aware of any, Joseph. As far as the, the white phosphorus, I've seen those press reports, uh, and, and you've seen that the uh, State Department uh, has an effort underway, so I'd refer you to them for any yeah, questions sorry, about that. You mentioned the White Fossers. How about the attacks in Gaza? Or did you know? uh, I'm not tracking the U.S. Department of Defense conducting any investigations uh, in Gaza. Tom. Thanks, General. <coughs> uh, Mr. Kirby said the, um, the new space capability, space-based capability was troubling. How troubled or how concerned is the Pentagon? Well, again, I'm not going to be able to get into any specifics regarding this particular threat due to the classification. Um, you know, on any given day, the, the Department of Defense monitors threats from around the world. And we work hard to mitigate those threats, uh, and we'll take appropriate action in defense of the nation. And so today is no different. Okay, and separately, um, could you please give an assessment of how effective the U.S.-led um, campaign has been at degrading Houthi capabilities? Um, in terms of, like, well, we're still seeing, you know, numerous, numerous attacks and then self-defense strikes. Um, the idea of this was to obviously act as a deterrent and also to degrade the capabilities. So, well, the, the idea was to respond to a threat uh, that the Houthis have been presenting since mid-November, right, when they started to attack international shipping. And so the United States, in concert, with over 20 different nations have come together to help protect international shipping through the Red Sea, uh, as well as work with international partners to conduct strikes against Houthi capability and degrade those capabilities. And so we do assess that we have degraded uh, some of their capability. Uh, and again, we will continue to take appropriate action to prevent uh, 
attacks against international shipping. Um, as you've seen and as you've highlighted, uh, we continue to see those attacks occur and we'll continue to take appropriate action. Our focus here, though, is not on fighting the Houthis. It's on two things. One, ensuring that uh, international shipping and mariners are able to transit the, uh, the Red Sea safely and securely, and two, as necessary, degrading their capability to mitigate and prevent these kinds of attacks from happening. Have you done an assessment of the extent to which that degradation has occurred because the attacks are still going we're, we're continually assessing. But you can't put a... You can't put a like, well, you can't, I, I mean... Uh, describe Again, we're going to continue working closely with the international community to, to to help degrade and disrupt their ability to conduct these attacks. And ultimately, again, as I've highlighted before, the Houthis have to ask themselves what, what price are they willing to pay to take on the international community uh, and have these capabilities degraded uh, and ultimately put their own people in, in danger. Body. Thank you, General. So in the last 24 hours, there's been um, escalation and, and series of uh, attacks by Israel and Lebanon that led to the death of, in one incident, family of seven, including two children, and another one, uh, mother and her two children. First of all, is, is the department concerned about this escalation going beyond what we've seen so far between Lebanon and Israel? And my question is, despite everything we hear from you, from the secretary, from the department about the need to protect civilians, the toll keeps on growing, whether in Gaza, the West Bank, and or Lebanon. Does the secretary think he needs to have a different approach to his Israeli counterparts to make maybe uh, make his message clearer on this issue? Yeah, thanks, Fadi. Um, so on your first question, I mean, we've been concerned about escalation along the Israel Lebanon border since Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th, as you know. Uh, and so we have uh, continued to uh, maintain a very um, focused effort to prevent that escalation from happening, as you've seen in many of the readouts that Secretary Austin has had with his Israeli counterpart. This has been a topic of discussion. And you've heard uh, others like uh, the National Security Advisor just yesterday talk about the efforts that are underway to uh, to de-escalate that situation. So again, we'll continue to stay focused on that. As it relates to civilian casualties, uh, as we've said, the loss of any innocent lives is, is tragic, uh, whether it's Palestinian or Israeli. Uh, at the end of the day, this is Israel's campaign. It's Israel's operations. So, so I'm not gonna speak to their operations other than to say we can't be any more clear that we do not wanna see the loss of innocent lives. We also recognize the fact that Israel has an inherent right to defend itself against future terrorist attacks and that they're fighting an adversary that has embedded itself among the civilian population. So we're going to continue to encourage them and continue to expect them to abide by the law of armed conflict and the international humanitarian law. Uh, and we'll continue to, you know, again, as you saw in the readout last night that the secretary had with his counterpart. Uh, talking about the importance of taking civilian safety into account on, in, in advance of any operations. Excuse me, but when, when the department provides <coughs> advice, intelligence, weapons, and support like this, and you talk about an enemy that is embedded among civilians, I guess you're referring to Gaza. What about the West Bank? What about Lebanon? And then to say that it's up to Israel to decide what to do. Isn't this department taking actually an important role in enabling Israel's actions? Uh, we're taking an important role in helping uh, Israel defend itself, but also encouraging uh, and helping to facilitate humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people. Again, at the end of the day, the goal here is that Hamas is defeated and so that peace and security can return to this region. And as you've heard not only uh, the White House say, but us say, work toward a two-state solution so that Israelis and Palestinians can live in this area uh, with security guaranteed for both. Let me go on to some other questions here. Jeff. General, thanks very much. Given the deals that Russia has made and the help that it's gotten from countries like uh, North Korea, Iran, support from China, is there any concern at the Pentagon that the new an space-based anti-satellite capability it's developing is a result of collaboration with any other U.S. adversaries? And is there concern perhaps that Russia, because of other deals to get help with the, with the war in Ukraine, might have shared any of this 
technology with other U.S. adversaries. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. A again, as it relates to this particular threat beyond uh, what Mr. Kirby provided in his briefing earlier, I'm, I'm just not going to have any additional details to provide. Thanks. Chris. Um, on the Houthi capabilities that have been degraded, um, CENTCOM's interdicted vessels um, with weapons uh, bound for Yemen, um, are, are the Houthis regenerating any of these capabilities? Are they being successfully resupplied? Um, look, I'm not going to go into any specific intelligence, but we do know that the Houthis are resourced um, and supported by uh, Iran. And so, uh, again, in, you know, that obviously is highlighted in the, the statements that, that CENTCOM has put out. Uh, and so, uh, again, um, you know, that's something that we're going to continue to take seriously uh, and continue to attempt to uh, mitigate. Thank you. Let me go to the phone here. Uh, Jeff Shogel, Task and Purpose. Thank you. I know this may be a question for Soviet Premier Putin, but the god-awful thing that the Russians want to put into space, is it like Goldeneye, the thing from the 1995 Bond movie? And is the is it time for all of us on the ground to join Jed and the Wolverines? <laughs> Jeff, I'm not sure how to respond to that. Um, I guess we just have to live and let die. <laughs> All right. Let me go on to uh, JJ Green, WTOP. Sorry. Um, General, thank you for doing this. Um, back, again, on the Russian advance regarding space-based weapons, I, I don't want to ask you about intelligence or, or you know, details about what, what, what's known about it. I, I want to ask something different but related. Russia has been pretty aggressive in space for a while now. And, you know, going back to 2020, when Russian uh, satellites were stalking U.S. satellites, in 2022, a Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs official said that commercial satellites might be legitimate targets. So my question is, what approach does the Pentagon take routinely to, uh, one, protecting U.S. US satellites and, and U.S. military uh, I guess assets, et cetera. But in general, it's just keeping an eye on on what Russia's up to in in space because of its aggressive and somewhat reckless behavior in the past. Yeah, thanks, JJ. It's it's a great question, and uh, as I alluded to earlier, you know there is a, recogni a recognition uh, that space has continued to, to become more congested, uh, as you highlight. You know all, all the capabilities that are there, but also more contested in terms of seeing strategic competitors like China and Russia putting capabilities into space that could threaten not only national security capabilities, but also commercial uh, and private capabilities that are, that are in space. Uh, and so, um, again, you have U.S. Space Command, uh, which provides the operational capability to integrate uh, national uh, or military space capabilities, national defense space capabilities. Uh, which can include uh, ensuring that we're able to maintain our operations, but also looking at protecting and defending capabilities in space. I'm not going to go into uh, discussing any classified capabilities, uh, but part of this includes looking at things like how we um, present capabilities in space. And what I mean by that is uh, disaggregating, right? Previously uh, in a simpler time, you would put a large, exquisite satellite in the space that had lots of capabilities. That's a single point of failure versus going to much more numerous, smaller satellites that, that are uh, less expensive that can be replaced more quickly, uh, thus making it harder to, to take down a system uh, you know, in, in one fell swoop. So there's multiple different ways that we look at this, uh, but that's what the U.S. Space Force comes to work every single day looking at uh, to ensure that our national interests are protected in space, uh, as well as uh, working with allies and partners on that same issue. All right. Ma'am. Thank you. Uh, according to U.S. Ambassador to Turkey, Jeffrey Flake, the Department of Defense is building three munition lines in Texas uh, together with one of the uh, Turkish state-owned defense corporations. 
uh, the demand for especially 155 millimeter rounds increased after the invasion of Ukraine and uh, the mechanical and chemical industry corporation of Turkey produced them uh, in some capacity in Turkey. Uh, what are the uh, details of the uh, cooperation and uh, what is the expected monthly production capacity of this Texas compound? And the last one is, do you have details such as chances uh, for a U.S. sale or delivery of these to Israel in the future? I apologize. I'm not sure I fully understand your question. There was a lot there. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. The Department of Defense is building three munition lines in Texas uh, with Turkish Defense Corporation. And what kind of cooperation is there? Can you give us some details on that? Yeah, I, I just don't know. Um, I, I have to take that question for you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, Pat. This is Tima from Al Jazeera English. I just wanted to see if you could give us anything further on Guyana and the urgent uh, U.S. military assistance that has been reportedly headed over there. Do you have anything further on, us, on that for us? Um, I, I don't, and I don't want to wing it from the podium here, so let me take that question. Um, yeah, I'll we'll come back to you. Okay, time for a couple more. Yes. Uh, moving back to that uh, anti-satellite weapon Russia's developing, um, did releasing this national security threat publicly yesterday hurt national security in any way or put anyone from the Defense Department at a disadvantage in speaking with their Russian counterparts? Um, well, look, I'm not going to characterize it. it. It is what it is. Uh, Mr. Kirby addressed uh, this from the podium today in terms of, you know, the, the declassification processes and procedures. Uh, so I will do my part in terms of protecting classified information and refrain from commenting any further on that particular topic. Yeah. Is there a timeline for Secretary Austin to review the internal review on his hospitalization and how that was handled? Yeah, I don't I don't have a timeline. Um, as you know, we've highlighted, he does have it for review. Um, and certainly, again, we're committed to providing as much information about that review uh, as we can. And so we'll continue to keep you updated on that front. Thank you. And last question, go to Mike. Uh, the, uh, thanks, Pat. The Atlantic Resolve IG report that just came out, uh, the IG uh, noted that Ukraine is still operating under basically a Soviet-style doctrine in the field. Why it was, it, I was wondering, since I was under the impression over the last several months that uh, we, the U.S. has been trying to train them to operate under a more Western U.S. style of war. Has that been uh, a success since they're still fighting the same way and have not moved in seven, eight months? Well, um, there's a, a lot there in that question, obviously, um, depending on how deep you want to go. I would say, broadly speaking, I think the results that Ukraine demonstrated after being invaded almost two years ago speak for themselves in terms of their ability to improvise, overcome, and adapt on the battlefield. Had that not been the case, we'd be in a much different place right now, um, you know, instead of Ukraine having taken back 50% of the territory that the Russian military uh, occupied at one point. That said, uh, as you've seen today, uh, it continues to be a tough fight, uh, and the Russians continue to throw a significant amount of capability into the fight, um, you know, consequences be damned. Uh, and so, we are going to continue to support them. We're going to continue to advise as best we can. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's up to Ukraine to plan and execute its operations. Um, but what we will do and what we are doing is continuing to work very closely with the international community. Uh, we just had the Ukraine Defense Contact Group yesterday uh, to ensure that we understand what their most urgent needs are ensure that we can work together to get that to them as quickly as possible, but then also importantly, work with the Ukrainian military on what its future force looks like so that they can deter future aggression from Russia uh, and prevent uh, another invasion from happening. Thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it.